Meiha Wenehinkum, Nithwanya Ne, Jessa Calderon, Pongvet Neha, Koi Chumash. Hello, relatives. My name is Jessa Calderon. I am Tongva and Chumash, currently calling in right now from the homelands of Bayom Kawicham peoples, which is just a little bit down the way southern, um, some people call Luiseno territory. Um, I am grateful to be here with you all today and I acknowledge that if you're watching this video that you are in Tongva territory which is Los Angeles County um, which also includes though <laughs> parts of the Riverside County and Orange County as well as our four channel islands deep into our Angeles forest so I thank you for being here with us today I hope that during this session you keep your heart open and your mind open to learn and explore and experience and, and deeply understand um, we are in many a crisis and it's really important to me um, that you all listen to the indigenous voices because you know pre-colonization if you take a look right outside there in Los Angeles you see it's engulfed in concrete and if you really think about it and you remove that concrete there's fresh dirt under there you know our mother earth is right under that concrete she's alive and well you notice those quote unquote weeds coming right out of the cracks there's something to that so i just hope that you uh really listen to the indigenous voices and understand on a deeper level of how we can come closer to revitalization and therefore um, deal less with these extreme fires and so on you know when we bring back our cultural burns and understanding that um, colonization has really taken away our roles and responsibilities as caretakers of this earth and in so many ways what has happened doesn't land on us but we are willing to share as much as we can to make sure that our next seven generations have a chance at life so um, I just needed to share that before we get started, um, I would like to honor the ancestors of the area, the Tongva territory, and as well as honoring your ancestors, you know, the song that I'm singing, it honors the four directions, and so in that way, it brings us together. De ho vetamer hanuk vetam 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 Tu me comi ke taime paime 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 Te ho vetamer hanuk vetam 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 Tu me comi ke taime paime 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 Te ho vetamer hanuk vetam 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 
tu me comí que tai me pai me 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 te hobe ta me hanuk veta Awesh koneha, awesh koneha, awesh koneha. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow this up with another song, uh, modern day style. I am also a hip hop artist. I go by the name of Jessica Calderon. So um, you can find my music on all major platforms. If you enjoy this song, it's called Home of the Brave. So you can look it up on all platforms as well as watch the music video on YouTube. Enjoy. Home of the brave, not land of the free. Crooked cops saw my streets, said he harassing my peeps. Columbus didn't discover ish, he was lost at sea. Therefore, my folks discovered him. There were no borders when the Santa Maria came ashore. What gives immigrants the right to tell the indigenous you can't be here no more? That's hypocrisy at its finest. I pray they'll see in America's ugliest colors. No, that doesn't define us, us indigenous people, cause we too had a taste, had our culture stripped and traditions taken away. Some folks make religion far too tremendous, keep taking it to war. Religion will end us, that's not a promise or a threat. The way that we treat this world, that's simply something we can expect. If we keep moving this way, we're guaranteed regret. And I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. And times haven't changed, fools like Trump wanna make the indigenous go away. Illegal is the term being used freely. Know the bloodline of your family. Cause Europe isn't close. I'll walk across that Mexican border for your land, I'll need a plane or boat. The doctrine of discovery gives the right to steal, kill, and harm. I can't fathom rape came from the word of God. Man has an urge for profit, greed, and power. Once the land's in their hands, they begin to devour. Everything is poison from water, food to our minds. They manipulate and you don't see it as a crime. Open your eyes, realize nothing they do benefits you. Illness stems from their modified foods and will inhale disease with the air that we breathe. When Earth's used up, we can't just leave. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. Said I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. 2020 something still breeds stupidity. As much as we've advanced, we took a thousand steps back. And it's the future of our children hurting. As these gases keep burning, so many lives die at the hands of oil companies' corruption. Oil they steal, oil they spill, then turn around like it ain't nothing. The Cree said you cannot eat money. My question to you, what will you do when you destroy the water and land so bad there's no water or food? Will you turn to your Bible and pray or heal the destruction and hate? Our actions determine our fate. Let us love and respect our mother earth before it's too late. That's the least we could do. How can you kill the one who's loved you from the womb? How can you kill the one who's loved you from the womb? I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. Can't call my folks illegal if yours came across the sea. Ah, uh. <laughs> thank you once again. My name is Jessica Calderon and I really enjoy, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the session. And again, keep your eyes, your mind, your third eye, your heart, keep it all open and walk in love. Much love and respect. Hi, my name is Quien, and I'm an Asian woman with dark brown hair slicked back against a white background. I am speaking to you from Tongva land. On behalf of young entertainment activists and our Racial Justice and Indigenous Rights Committee, we welcome you to Centering the Land and Creating the Future. This is a conversation between three incredible speakers about how indigenous methodologies and understandings of our relationship to the land 
can reframe the climate narrative and illuminate a path toward climate justice and a brighter future. This panel is moderated by the brilliant Ali Young, a citizen of the Diné Navajo Nation from the Northern Agency of the Reservation in Northern New Mexico. Ali is a storyteller, writer, and activist on a mission to increase the authentic representation of Native people in the media. She is also the program manager at Harness, where she founded the program Protect the Sacred, a grassroots movement that focuses on educating and empowering the next generation of Indian country leaders and allies. Our incredible panelists are Jade Begay and Mark Tilson. Jade, Diné and Tasuke Pueblo, is a filmmaker and an indigenous rights and climate justice organizer. She is the climate justice campaign director at NDN Collective, where she is building climate solutions on indigenous terms and serves on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Mark is an Oglala Lakota poet educator from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. At Standing Rock, he stepped into the role of a direct action trainer and police liaison. He has led trainings and teach-ins about lessons learned from Standing Rock and just published a book of poetry about his experiences. He recently spent six months helping fight against the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, the tail end of the Dakota Access Pipeline that terminates in Louisiana. We are so grateful to have you here. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Allie Young. I am in the Navajo Nation. I am also the founder of Protect the Sacred and um, Programs Manager at Harness, um, where I bring the native lens to our uh, the programs at Harness. Um, and yeah, I'm just so excited to be a part of this conversation. I'm, um, I am wearing, uh, pink AirPod Max headphones and have a little, um, Calvin Klein hoodie on. All right. So, you know, every nation and tribe has their own protocol for introductions. Uh, and with that, I want to invite Jade and Mark to please introduce yourselves. Thanks, Ali. Um, hi everyone, uh, it's really great to be here. I'm uh, honored to be here among Mark and Ali, um, who I've worked with in different capacities um, over the years, so it's good to reconnect everybody. Um, yeah, yeah, I think my bio spoke to most of my work. Um, you know, as far as where I come from, I'm calling in from uh, my ancestral lands, uh, Tewa lands here in northern New Mexico, so-called northern New Mexico, um, calling from Oga Po Oge, which is um, known as Santa Fe, New Mexico, but um, in our language, Tewa, um, it's, the, it's the white shell place. And I'm Tasuke Pueblo um, and Diné, and uh, I am the Climate Justice Campaign Director at NDN Collective, a uh, indigen indigenous-led um, nonprofit that builds indigenous power. Um, I also serve on the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, um, and I moonlight as a filmmaker um, and uh, media maker. Uh, so happy to be here. Um, to describe myself, I am wearing a white t-shirt and um, I, I think my hair is kind of taking up a, a lot of the space in my screen. Um, yeah, dark brown hair and there's bangs. Pass it to you, Mark. Uh, 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 my name is Mark Kenneth Tilson. I'm Oglala Lakota from Porcupine, South Dakota. I'm a poet and an educator, um, but in these circles, calling myself an activist or a water protector might be more accurate, even though I don't care for the terms. I uh, am freshly shaven and I'm wearing a violently colorful Samoan shirt. Um, and then we'll go back to Jade for this first question. Was there a specific moment you can remember which led uh, you to your activism? Yeah, I, 
I actually love talking about this moment because it is twofold in that it, I think it, um, I get to shout out one of my, one of my dear friends and mentors. And I also um, can promote like why it's important to invest in, in our indigenous youth. So um, back when I, I was, um, yeah, I was still pretty young. I was straight out of, um, I was straight out of undergrad, moving into grad school and um, really uh, uh, just getting activated. I've, I've been activated from like a young age uh, because of my surroundings, because of my identity, all of that. Um, but as far as like getting like involved in the issues and like learning all the nuances, I was just at that like beginning stage um, as a young adult. And um, Bioneers supported me as a indigenous youth fellow to go to the Bioneers conference. And I saw Ariel de Ranger speak. Um, Ariel is the executive director of the Indigenous Climate Action Group um, based in so-called Canada. And I, yeah, I think it just, it like took my breath away the way she spoke about our issues. And it, um, it really affirmed for me like that, um, and it, it affirmed for me like both um, how we can hold power as indigenous women in these spaces and um, and demand you know investment into our work and into our communities, um, but also it was uh, one of the first times I, I saw like a really powerful indigenous woman speak on a stage in front of like a thousand people, and so it just um, gave me a lot of it gave me like a confidence boost and uh, really like activated and pushed me to. Um, continue to pursue my my like professional career in this space and and to do that with like a sense of courage and a sense of pride. Love that. And Mark, um, can you describe how you think of and contextualize your own relationship to the land? Like it's it's where my family, it's where our graves are. Like it's where my family, like it's where we bury our family. It's where we we literally return back to the land after the ending of this linear life, this human existence, and as we journey on into a spiritual one. Um, from the indigenous perspective, from the Lakota perspective, we like don't necessarily own the land, and the land doesn't really belong to us, but we belong to the land. Um, I think it's kind of an inverse of like uh, colonial constructs, and. It's the land is our mother, the land is our relative, the land provides everything we need. And I also think the oblig like I think this generation, like we have an obligation to defend the land and the water. And so it's not just like, oh, what's your relationship? Oh, my family hunts, we fish, we we actually have duties, we have a responsibility. So that relationship is not without um, obligation. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and as, as we um, move towards uh, kind of breaking down uh, the definitions of the things that we talk about in our community, like land back, um, you know, I'll, I'll take it back over to Jade real quick um, to first ask, what does land ownership mean to you? Thanks, Ali. Um, so when I um, when I think of land ownership, I, I feel really inspired um, by some sentiments shared by other movement allies and some of our movement ancestors. Um, Malcolm X once said that ownership of land is power. Um, John Boyd, who is a, a movement ally working for um, working to grow the movement of black farmers has said in the past that the only thing closest to freedom is land ownership. And of course, we, we know that 
these folks didn't mean ownership in like a colonial way, but in, in having land and having access to land um, to be able to uh, um, assert our self-determination, to have self-determination, um, to have this you know, sense of interdependence, like Mark was saying, um, to be able to feed ourselves, to be able to um, nourish our families our, and our communities, um, to be able to continue our life ways, our ceremonies, um, you know, that's, that's especially um, important for indigenous peoples and cultures. Um, so yeah, I think for me, I've been, um, like I said earlier, inspired by these, these points um, around having land, whether we think of it in terms of, of being in relationship to or having interdependence or ownership, um, you know, whatever, whatever that is, it's, it's about having, having that power and being able to um, have sovereignty in that way. What about you, Mark? Um, how do you define land ownership? I'm, I currently don't own any land. I'm a landless uh, person, uh, unlanded gentry, let's say that. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I think that like, if we're, talking, if we're talking about how to survive for indigenous people, traditionally like owning, controlling land is, was the way of sustaining ourselves through farming, through ranching, as we got moved onto reservation systems. So it was creating our economic base was about still maintaining some semblance of control over our own land. And once we were removed from that, um, you know, poverty was, became incredibly rampant. Um, when you can sustain and feed yourself, it's really hard to call a people poor who are self-sufficient. Um, so when we're talking about land ownership for indigenous people, I think it's about our long-term survival of having connection to that land. And yeah, we kind of have to buy into the whole capitalism and the construction of it in order to do it. Um, ultimately, land ownership in America is about the, the closing of the commons, the closing off uh, in separate, it's uh, putting up fences, um, saying this part, like parceling it out and creating really, you know, lines on the map of saying this belongs to you and this belongs to you. Whereas indigenous people, we never, that was a really foreign concept to us prior to colonization. And I think in the future, like, get, like land ownership is not so much about replicating, um, like replicating the same systems of oppression, but using it as a tool towards an, to an, to an eventual uh, native liberation. Yeah, I always think it's so interesting, um, you know, land ownership, especially, you know, related to tribal nations and our reservations. Because, um, you know, when I talk to non-native folks, they're always surprised that, you know, within our own tribal lands, we don't really actually own it, you know, or, um, you know, like on, on the Navajo Nation, it's called a home site lease. Anyone, if you're going to build a home on our own ancestral lands, our own reservation, um, we have to, it's, it's a difficult process. It's a long one um, to apply for a home site lease. And even in that, in that uh, term lease, you know, we're, it, we're not actually owning this land, we're borrowing it from the government. Um, and it, it's, it's just crazy to think about. Um, but I think um, that's why these uh, campaigns have, have been launched and Jade, like NDN Collective has kind of brought land back to the surface uh, with the campaign that you all have launched um, over the last year. Um, can you uh, talk to us a little bit about that and, and what land back means? Yeah, and, and I know that the land back team would really appreciate to um, just say that, you know, our, our model um, and our campaign for land back is, is one of many that are active across Turtle Island, um, across North America, 
and across the world. There are so many um, beautiful efforts um, happening right now across indigenous communities globally to, um, to reclaim land um, and to demand land back. Um, as far, you know, we have our we have our set of definitions for land back in that campaign. Um, and you know that that can all be found at landback.org. Um, but just you know, personally speaking, for me, um, and this is how I see land back through the lens of climate justice as well. Um, land back is really about restoring kinship. Um, it's about restoring interdependence um, and coming back um, into the land. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily um, we're not necessarily saying you know uh, evict all the people. <laughs> um, I think that's a very uh, um, assumptive or even kind of like um, discriminatory way of viewing land back. Um, it's it's about having what we lost back in our lives, having our languages, our cultures protected, and being able to, um, yeah, restore those relationships to our our land and um, and our ecosystems. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I'm viewing land back at, at the moment. And of course, there's other layers. Um, you know that it, it's 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 a racial justice issue. It's a it's a um, economic justice issue. It's um, climate. I think land back can be really is a really holistic um, uh, and and really like a, a systems approach to ensuring that our communities are are able to thrive and and continue our our life ways. Awesome. Um, it just made me think of, uh, and, and we'll get to this in a little bit about storytelling and, and um, talking about you know climate and climate justice through storytelling. But um, the one of the episodes of Reservation Dogs was just a great <laughs> where the couple's driving in the car and they're talking about land back and and what does that mean? Does that mean they want all of the land back? <laughs> and, um, so I, I just thought that was a brilliant way of, um, of introducing that term to um, the non-native community. Um, but so Mark, um, do you wanna chime in with your definition of land back? I will, yeah, I, I just gotta say like, whenever somebody talks about land back, there's always so much land back anxiety from people who are hearing it for the first time. Cause it's that, it's that scene is like, what do you mean? It's like like and then we always have people who come on jade like we're no we don't mean to evict all of the settlers and i always like i'm thinking of hans molman in the background be like i was saying boo birds and i always think of my radical friends who are like no i'm straight up about evicting people and getting some back rent that being said um i think when people hear that land back for the first time that anxiety is super super real because it's like because when we took the land we didn't just take the land we did a lot of other really messed up stuff to you and it's like we don't actually want to replicate replicate colonization onto you we don't want to like get you a new god take your language um separate you from your family like create an entire hierarchy of beauty standards that kind of makes you hate yourself like that's not part of our goal I, I, again Hans Molman not part of my goal I'll say um and yeah totally uh just like storytelling like the, one of the most beautiful statistics and you know I'm kind of a nerd but like 20 percent of the lands in North America are held by indigenous people and they hold 80 percent of the biodiversity like we don't believe in monocultures in our land management practices typically so when land is back in indigenous hands, it becomes vibrant. It becomes, um, what was the term, CO2? It holds more CO2 in the grass. When you have indigenous grasslands with like buffalo and prairie dogs, than you do under a monoculture of just continuous cattle rotation. And you have fuel and you have less methane. And 
under and uh, we're seeing in California, we're seeing like what happens when you've abandoned these thousands and thousands of year old practices of having a relationship with the woods, with the grasslands and fire, which is a naturally occurring phenomenon. And now we're seeing these like fire tornado warnings for the first time in American history. And yeah, and then it's like, this is what happens when you remove land from indigenous people. And when you remove indigenous people from the land, we were in relationship with it and we were helping maintain the balance of it. And in, in just what I said, I also talked about climate justice. I mean, I think a lot of people also wonder what that is. Um, and so do, Jay, do you have any, um, do you have your definition of what climate justice is? Yeah, we have our, we have our definition uh, within the NDN Collective Climate Justice Campaign. Um, and I'll, I'll share that. Uh, I'll read that to you all. So it's, um, climate justice defined by indigenous dreaming is an invitation into complexity, a surrendering to the truth, and a reckoning with the extractive society in order to revitalize possibility. Climate justice is about thriving through the climate crisis with dignity and being able to proactively respond um, and not be caught up in a cycle of reacting and, and being victims. Um, you know, we know that this, this crisis is here. We all um, got the news about a month ago, actually to the date um, that from the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that we are in code red. Um, when it comes to like the severity of the climate crisis. Um, we also learned that between now and uh, 2050, the climate impacts that we're seeing right now, like Mark just mentioned, tornado fires, um, uh, wildfires in the West, drought, uh, flooding in the East Coast and the Gulf Coast, um, extreme weather, that all of these impacts are actually um, going to get more severe and more frequent. And um, the impacts of our current climate crisis are irreversible. So the damage that we've done, um, and let me be more specific, the damage that the fossil fuel industry, the damage that um, uh, big carbon emitting countries like the US and like China have done to our climate. Um, we can't reverse that where we've reached that tipping point. Um, and, and, and speaking of tipping points and Mark's point about holding biodiversity and trying to protect biodiversity. Um, I also sit on the board of Amazon watch and work very closely with, um, our, our relatives down in the global south and in the Amazon in particular. And right now the Amazon is at a tipping point. Um, we may lose that ecosystem in our lifetimes and due to ranching, due to extractive industry. Um, so, you know, going back to the, the definition here, um, you know, land back actually falls very much into how we define climate justice um, at NDN Collective and, and myself as, as a person that um, it is about um, coming back into our lands. Um, like I said earlier, um, restoring kinship with our in, uh, indigenous ecological knowledge so that we can better prepare ourselves and our communities and protect ourselves and our communities um, in, this, in this crisis. And Mark, um, how how can indigenous, I think methodologies, but also uh, storytelling, you know, we have a lot of um, lessons that we learn from, you know, our creation stories and the stories that have been passed down to us for, um, you know, since time immemorial, um, you know, how, how can that help us build toward climate justice? One, uh, I think that can build help for indigenous people. We are going to survive. Um, 
And I think that's one of the important things as indigenous people that we have to know, we have to recognize that we've survived genocide, we've survived ice ages, we have, so pro we have survived, this is not our first rodeo, this is not our first apocalypse. We've been through a collapse before and some of us are going to make it and we will have descendants and we will have great grandchildren one day and we're gonna make it. And we have to internalize that. And some people call that hope, I just call that a realistic expectation of belief. Um, so that's one. The other side is we have to basically uh, destroy capitalism and end this civilization as we know it, if we want to continue to exist as human beings. Um, and there's not really another way to do that. There's not like 20 years ago, we could have been having a very different conversation. 30 years ago, we were having very different conversations. And now we're seeing um, what they call like cascade effects, where one part of the ecosystem collapses onto the next, onto the next, onto the next, which creates exponential change, which we were, again, I was talking about this three years ago as hypothetical what we were gonna see within our lifetime. And now it's literally happening. Um, so can we, stop the, can we stop the advanced burning of fossil fuels before the tundra in the Arctic and in the Siberia releases uh, the permafrost methods? Don't know. I honestly don't know the answer to that question, but I hope we can. And we have to recognize that is a goal, first and foremost, and then we should be fighting like hell for it. Secondly, what does story, indigenous storytelling have to do in the understanding of climate justice? When I think of justice, I almost think putting somebody's bastards on trial. Like Exxon knew about this since 1958, since 1962, and we're lock in step with global warming and CO2 emissions, and they paid billions to cover up. They've created, in, they've created the Cato Institute. They've created entire, the petroleum industry has created entire pseudoscience to obscure, like, to obscure this fact where it's still being debated on Fox News of whether or not climate change is real and whether or not is man-made and whether or not anything can be done about it. Because the narrative shift that's happening needs to be challenged. And that narrative shift is like, yes, it's real. Yes, it's happening. It's man-made and there's nothing to be done except to ride it out and to go be with our families before the skies turn dark from all of the smoke and the ash. It's looking pretty ashy out today. And also it gets the petroleum industry, that narrative gets the petroleum industry off the hook. And that narrative definitely needs to be challenged. There are those who have known about this for decades and some are still alive and some are still making billions off of this climate catastrophe. And they're still funding politicians to not do anything. Totally agree. I, I mean, you talked about um, indigenous peoples surviving the apocalypse. And, you know, a lot of what we're seeing today happening in the news and across the, the world um, kind of seems, feels ap apocalyptic. And, you know, I, I, when I talk to people about, um, you know, climate storytelling and, and how, you know, in Hollywood and TV shows and films, um, we're starting to include this climate storyline and, and talk about um, what's happening. Um, I, I, I'm often reminding folks to please include indigenous storytelling um, and also um, bring, you know, our perspectives into these storylines um, because one, we are the original storytellers and, um, you know, from our creation stories and um, there's, a, there's no better storyteller in my opinion than uh, Native peoples <laughs> and, um, and then two, you know, we're water protectors, we're land defenders. Um, we know that special relationship with Mother Earth. And I think that um, we, as you said, Mark, we've, we've been through this. And 
um, you can almost um, kind of see this, um, see history repeating itself. And that's why, you know, storytelling and, and um, surfacing these issues um, is so important so that we don't repeat history. You know, we're, um, we saw what happened to us in, in our population, in our community, where um, colonization, you know, wiped, nearly wiped us out. Um, and we, and, and that was because of greed and, um, and, and wanting to own, you know, all of this land. Um, and then now, you know, fast forward, we're kind of seeing the same thing happening again, except like the human race is like the indigenous peoples. And, um, and what we're seeing from capitalism is, you know, they're, they're the new colonizers, well, they've always been, <laughs> but, um, you know, we're, we're kind of seeing like what happened to us with forced assimilation that has caused intergenerational trauma that is in our blood. And now we're seeing um, what these extractive industries are doing to our mother earth and our, in our, um, in the human race. It's, um, as you mentioned, Mark, all of these different companies that have, have known what these different chemicals do to our bodies. And we, we, they're literally, um, we have these, toxic chemicals in our blood now um, because of that capitalism and that greed. So, you know, I kind of kind of see that this sort of genocide playing out again. Um, and I think that's why it's so important to definitely <laughs> tap on in indigenous peoples um, and our knowledge that uh, will build toward climate justice. Um, yeah, and, and I don't know if you all want, if you all want to chime in on this uh, storytelling piece, Jade, um, and, and, you know, with, with everything that's happening in the world, uh, what, all, what all does it have to do with storytelling and about the narratives we tell ourselves? Well, there's, there's so many narratives to uplift uh, when it comes to Indigenous peoples and climate justice. Um, certainly, you know, the ones that you and Mark both laid out um, and, you know, in addition to me being, you know, original storytellers, um, we're also uh, the original climate scientists. Um, our elders, our ancestors have been collecting data about the land um, pre-contact um, and have been, you know, holding um, ecological knowledge um, for centuries. So I think that's that's another aspect of climate justice um, that we're really excited to be working on and developing, um, not just supporting indigenous researchers and scientists to continue this long practice of, of um, studying the land and studying the changes um, in our ecosystems, but um, also just affirming the, um, the narrative, I guess, and, uh, the, and the belief that our, our people already have the knowledge to survive this. Our people already have the tools and the technology to survive this crisis. Um, and we just need to be resourced, um, to be able to, you know, carry out, um, yeah, these different practices and develop them. Um, and, you know, I know it's, it's hard to fit like narratives around, um, around like funding into uh, an investment into like TV shows and movies and things. But when we're talking about like documentaries, when we're talking about like impact production, impact strategies, when it comes to, you know, those types of, um, nonfiction stories, you know, we really want our allies who are making films about our issues to be advocating to have direct financing going back into our communities. Um, also a nerd and also a person who relies on statistics and uh, data points, but, um, you know, uh, 
0.4% of philanthropy in the US goes to indigenous communities. Meanwhile, climate scientists are saying indigenous knowledge holders are key to mitigating and adapting to, clim to the climate crisis and to climate change. So when you do that math in your head that we're key to solving this crisis, yet we're getting not half, not 1%, but half of, more than one half of 1% of all philanthropic dollars. And, and mind you, the, that, that sliver of a sliver is for all of the issues that indigenous peoples are working on, social justice, economic, um, you know, addressing the epidemics of suicide, uh, addressing the epidemics of um, missing and murdered indigenous people, um, voter, uh, uh, voter rights and suppression, you know, that tiny bit of funding is supposed to help us do all the things um, and not to mention solve the climate crisis. So we need to be, you know, actively when we're, when we're using our narratives, using our stories in films, whether they be fiction or nonfiction or shows, fiction or nonfiction, we also need to be thinking about driving, um, creating impact strategies. So we are driving direct financing and direct investment to indigenous communities so they can um, have lands, so they can protect biodiversity, so they can, um, you know, skill up and, and evolve and expand outward um, and share our traditional ecological knowledge with each other and, and skill up our youth. Um, so uh, yeah, I just wanted to make that point about um, adding impact strategy to uh, places in storytelling where where we're sh where our stories are being uplifted or shared. I would like to add. Um, let's recognize that only incredible radical change can save the planet. So we also that means we also need incredibly radical stories and narratives that are unabashedly radical and revolutionary. One of my favorite shows, Mr. Robot was talking about using like, you know, the hacker dream of being able to reorganize the economy and create a revolution. And it flinched away from this narrative by season two or by season three. It kind of abandoned that narrative and said like, this is all just a power game. That no, like a revolution is simply replacing power and that maintaining the status quo is probably the best that we can afford. While it was still a great show, one of my favorites, beautifully directed, acted, some of the most wonderful scenes I think I've ever seen on TV or in the show. But it flinched away from the idea that another world is possible, that a revolutionary action of the people united can create lasting change. And it had the idea and it walked away from it. And I think that is one of the challenges. Once we actually do create something that is beautiful, powerful, and actually inspiring. Like I know a bunch of like little QAnon kids that I'll go out fired up watching Mr. Robot, started learning to like code on like WordPad and started going to boot camps and got really, really fired up. And some of them are now working on cryptocurrency. And um helping helping investing their time and their mind in creating uh, encrypted applications to fight against the growing surveillance police state. And we need those stories that inspire, uh, inspire us and also inspire the next generation because um, our guy coming out of retirement from Blue's Clues to give everyone a heads up, I don't think that's going to cut it. That was really nice and I'm glad he did it. But uh, I think we need something more inspiring from the, uh, from the kids that are coming up because otherwise we're gonna see despair. And I think the people who like, you know, the one percenters, they're gonna be fine. They're gonna move to the last remaining paradises on the planet that are relatively um, ecologically stable. And those will change over decades and they'll move and buy the new paradises and they'll go there until climate change catches up and they have to keep moving and moving for the rest of us 
it's going to get tough. It's going to get really, really tough. And we have to create these radical empowering stories. Uh, Luke Skywalker was a moisture farmer on Tantooine. Might be the future. I know it was a galaxy long ago and very far away, but that might be an occupational, uh, occupational future we might be investing in. I couldn't agree more with Mark on this. And, you know, we're starting to see a lot of these like cli-fi, like climate science fiction genres appear. And I just, you know, bringing it back to indigenous people and cultures, um, you know, we're, our cosmologies are like the OG science fiction. Um, those are rooted in uh, ceremony and spirituality, of course, but, uh, you know, those visions, those prophecies, those are playing out. And um, I think, you know, we have to, um, at, and this is just kind of, you know, uh, yeah, like a call to action, I guess, for our people too, is just to, um, to go back into those spaces of ceremony, of um, go back into those spaces where we're able to prophesize um, and, and to hold on to that. And um, like Mark was saying, that that radical imagination, that, that thinking um, is really, you know, it's gotten us through all of these cycles of genocide. Um, and I really think it'll get us through this, this crisis as well. Um, here at NDN, we like to ask the question, what if the best times are ahead of us? Um, and, and, and we believe that. We believe that we can, we can create something. It's gonna be drier, it's gonna be hotter, it's gonna be hard, um, the future, but uh, we can build the circumstances in which you know, perhaps it's more liberated, perhaps there's more racial equity, perhaps we're working in a more balanced way with each other and with our environment. Um, so yeah, I, I totally support this and um, this, yeah, this notion of, of radi radically imagining what, what is possible. You know, how can we all work together to create a better future, you know, and beyond just within our native community, you know, thinking about our allies and as you mentioned, Jade, in the world of philanthropy, you know, those with, with the funding and the dollars. I am. Um... I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of lifting up off of uh, decolonizing capitalism and some conversations which I had with my brother Nick, but um, one of the things that he's talking about the big change in philanthropy is instead of invest like divesting from uh, the petroleum industry into indigenous hands into indigenous lands is almost more important than investing into greenwash technology and greenwashed funds. And using the principal capital, not just the interest, the typical understanding of philanthropy is people have amassed so much wealth and they do charitable deeds with the interest and wealth accrued on top of it. The point where it needs to change is saying the actual keeping of that wealth is inherently harmful because it supports the prison industrial complex, because it supports the military industrial complex, because it supports the fossil fuel industry, that even maintaining the status quo fundamentally hurts the world and the people inside of it. So the best we can do is to, to get those resources that have been, that have been hoarded gentr intergenerationally and redistribute them to the indigenous people of the land as quickly as possible. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we're in this critical moment um, coming off the tails of learning about, you know, our, our code red situation from um, the world's climate scientists who I believe really affirm a lot of indigenous knowledge and a lot of indigenous testimony um, of what we're seeing on the front lines. Um, we don't have a lot of time that is a key point in this climate report. Um, we have to rapidly reduce large scale emissions right now and, and, and do it quickly. And uh, like, like I said, large scale, like, 
whole governments, whole industries. Um, in this tiny window that we have where we might be able to um, make it so that past 20, uh, 2050, um, our future generations will have a safe climate. Um, that's like the window we're, and the opportunity we're given in this moment. Um, if we're not able to successfully do that, and like Mark is saying, if, if uh, corporations and governments continue to get away with these full solutions, like, um, like the carbon market, uh, carbon trading, um, net zero strategies, which is just all business as usual, right? They, they're paying to pollute. They're buying um, indigenous territories in the Amazon, stealing them, again, taking lands, dispossessing lands from indigenous peoples to pay for their pollution. If we continue in that pattern, um, we're gonna miss that window and we're gonna create um, you know, even worse we're on, we're reaching 1.5 Celsius global warming, which is, we're like there. Um, and that's kind of the code red, right? That we're hearing. If we get to two degrees, which we're kind of well on our way towards, um, it's, it's ecological collapse. Um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is bad, it's bad news. And we, game over, man, game over. <laughs> Game over. Um, yeah, I, I'm smiling nervously about it, but um, and with lots of anxiety about it. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I fully support Mark's um, like urgent uh, call to yeah have philanthropy, have industry, have government um, divest from fossil fuels as as they're moving resources. Um, over to indigenous communities and indigenous peoples and tribes. Um, also, I think on the individual level, because um, this is a question I get all the time, right? Like, what what can I do as as just a you know Joe Schmo or average person? Um, build community. It's really important that we have strong networks as we navigate the crisis. Um, like I said earlier, these impacts are, are here. They're going to get worse and they're going to continue to hit um, communities across the world, have a network to, to navigate a crisis with, ha know who you're going to call on, know, know how you're going to react when crisis hits. Um, it's really important that we have kinship in this moment, that we're working to heal our communities and divisions so that when crisis hits us, we, we are not in panic, we're not in scarcity mode. We can, we can work together to survive those moments um, because that's very real. It's, it's, you know, we're learning as we're seeing all these disasters play out now that when community is, is together and organized, um, they can survive uh, disasters and catastrophes better. And then like the, the next step is like a collective. You know, I, I always say that when I talk about, I talk a lot about the voting work that I've done um, and the organizing that we've all done in our respective communities. Um, I said, you know, the next step heading into these future elections is, collective organizing. So we've done an amazing job at organizing within our own communities. And I think next is, you know, we all have to come together as, as you know, a collective. You know, we're, we're still learning what that means, you know, how to be a good ally. But, you know, the, the more and more um, we put it into practice, I think that's, that's gonna create a better future. What change are you most excited to see happen as an outcome of this discussion? I want to see a pilot of a bunch of young indigenous people uh, counting coup on uh, oil executives and holding trials for them. Uh, that'd be, I'd watch that show. I'd watch it twice. Um, but also I look forward to working with you all in the future. Yes, that's awesome. I would, I'd watch that too. And Jade, uh, so the question is, 
what change are you most excited to see happen as an outcome of this discussion? Yeah, I have to kind of plus plus that pilot <laughs> show. Um, you know, I, I would like to see um, divestment from Hollywood in uh, fossil fuels. Um, as a filmmaker myself, who uh, I, I, I really am in this moment of like when, and I know this is like kind of reaching into the um, radical zone, but again, radical thinking, um, I am really thinking about like, when is it time for me to localize and, and just make stories in my local region, not fly here and there to tell stories? Um, when is it important for me to stop buying new gear because the all the minerals in the camera are coming from somewhere and I bet you that those minerals are coming from indigenous lands somewhere in, um, you know, either uh, the continent of Africa or in, in South America um, or, you know, lithium in Nevada. So, yeah, I, I think it's, I would love to see like a real, um, a real effort on, on Hollywood and the film industry to look at their carbon footprint and to really make um, commitments to not fall into the false solution um, side of things, not fall into the trap of carbon markets, paying paying off your pollution, um, buying those types of carbon credits, but um, rather, uh, yeah, what does it look like to localize? What does it look like to shift radically the industry so that it's not reliant or dependent on fossil fuels or petroleum. Yeah, I love that. And I, I mean, I used to work in the film industry. And so I was a PA at one point where I was up until like 3 a.m. printing hundreds and hundreds of scripts um, and then distributing them to all of the people that work on the crew. But even, I, and I know that there, there have been um, incredible things created in the last several years of um, distributing uh, scripts on like tablets and through uh, electronically. So anyway, I, I'd love to see that too. Just get really creative with the way that um, the industry has traditionally worked. But yeah, those radical changes are important. Um, well, thank you both. That was an amazing conversation. And Thank you both for bringing your knowledge to the table, but also, you know, you're, you're both um, in creative individuals, uh, Mark, you as a writer and Jade, you as a filmmaker. And, you know, thank you for bringing both of, both of those uh, hats to the table. And I, yeah, I really enjoyed our conversation and I was very happy to be with you all again. And I look forward to the next time we get to be conversation together. Likewise. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, everyone. Happy to be here. <laughs>